the age of 12, I moved to Japan with my family, and we were living in the countryside. My father was teaching English at the university there. I was enrolled into the Japanese public school system, which is rather unusual, and I was drawn to the kendo club. I had seen kendo uh, once before, and it seemed to have a deep history to it. I saw it as a good way to learn the culture and the language, but there is also a sense of discipline in kendo, which develops the human character, as they say, according to the principles of the sword or the katana. So I've been studying it for about 38 years now. My name is Tusha Bunton, the gallery director uh, here at uh, Robin Bunton of Honolulu. We're an art gallery. We deal in contemporary and traditional Asian and Hawaiian artwork. Kendo evolved out of samurai sword fighting and the code which the samurai had of how to be a good human being as they were the top tier in the feudal arrangement in Edo period Japan. Out of that culture, you have the proper way of handling yourself as well as handling the sword. Each clan had their own system of uh, sword fighting. They didn't want the other clans to know. It was secretive. How do you test this is the question. They could not just argue about it. And so if they wanted to actually prove that their techniques were better, they had to get their sword out and somebody died. So by developing the armor, the bamboo sword, you could practice the techniques of the sword without somebody getting killed every time. In samurai days, the ultimate idea was the day that you were going to die for your lord. And so they practice and develop themselves for that purpose. Whereas in modern day kendo, you are practicing how to live today. And that's much more important, uh, developing ourselves for the human character. That's what we're about. We're trying to make ourselves better people by doing this. Kendo came to Hawaii with the immigrants from Japan to work in the uh, sugarcane plantations, 1860s, uh, with the Meiji Restoration. If you can imagine working in the sugarcane fields all day and then doing something like kendo afterwards, kendo in itself is hot, it is sweaty, it is uh, difficult, and yet these people were practicing in those conditions and it was a way to connect with that Japanese culture. After World War II, Hawaii was one of the first places to start doing kendo again, and that's why we have such a strong uh, history and presence the kendo world. Without an opponent in kendo, uh, you're practicing by yourself, and so we're very grateful for the people that we practice with. In fact, when I bring a new student into kendo, I explain how to have respect for the place that we are practicing in, and to have respect for your opponents, because without them, we can't do what we do. We do a lot of basic or kihong training, how we handle our body, how we handle our tenouchi, or the grasping of the sword. A sword has a sharp edge, and the top one-third of the sword is the best cutting element you need to practice how to use that part correctly. When you get into full combat, you don't have time to think about how to hold the sword, how to do the correct footwork. And so by practicing it over and over again, you're able to develop the correct form. And only after many years of doing this can you develop the attitude and also what's called ki, your energy because we are pressuring our opponent. We are giving every possibility to stop attacking you. And that pressure is something that uh, develops over many, many years. Setsuninto or Katsujin Ken. Setsuninto is the killing sword. Katsujin Ken is the life-saving sword. 
allowing your opponent to back down, giving them life. But at the point that they attack you, the best defense is offense. The Japanese sword or the katana is probably one of the most iconic elements of Japanese culture. It is part of the imperial regalia, the heart of Shinto faith. People all over the world know what a Japanese sword is. You see it in modern culture, in manga and anime, all the time. The curvature of the blade is one of the most unique elements. Most swords are straight. That curvature gives it um, not just a unique look, but also cutting ability, which was the most powerful weapon in the world before the gun. The folding or the making of a blade is a religious ceremonial practice. In making a blade, they're infusing a spirit or a kami into the blade. We need to always, when we practice with it, respect that element to a sword. Fourth to sixth century, you see the introduction of metal blades coming from Korea and uh, mainland China. And then, of course, the evolution of the Japanese curved blade takes place sometime in the Heian period, about the 11th century. But then in the 13th century, during the Kamakura period, there was a Mongol invasion. And in that contact, the uh, a Mongol longsword broke the Japanese blade. And that really set into motion the development of a strong, sharp Japanese katana. The process of folding the iron starts with a block of iron ore, and then it is folded. Once you fold it twice, then you fold it again, that becomes four. You fold it again, that becomes 16 up until the point of 10,000 folds is the saying. Knowing the way to sandwich those folds for their strong and soft elements is the skill of the sword maker. You can see the grain, the way that the metallurgy works together, the shape of the blade, the curvature, or the sori how to make those clean lines look perfect. It's like shaping a diamond. You are looking for the beauty of how those lines go together. Yaido is what's called a sword drawing technique. You are taking a Japanese sword and using it in set scenarios with imaginary opponents. You are showing how to cut a single opponent in front of you. You sense his attack and finish him off first. Uh, you have three people attacking you from different sides. How to do such things as tenuchi or drawing, grasping of the hands so that the curvature of the sword cuts the right way. How to sheath the sword uh, back into its case. At the same time, maintaining that sense of presence in ki, in your energy. This all leads to the development in kendo of using those same techniques and ideas. The Kyoto Enbu Taikai is really one of the most traditional kendo tournaments. Uh, it is it, just one match per person, basically watching great teachers and great kendoists. I have always wanted to go and watch, but now that I'm able to enter myself, that's a great honor. I was really happy with my match. I was introduced to my opponent beforehand. I told him that I hope that we can do koken chiai, or mutual benefit by crossing swords. 
I started off with strong ki. I was able to get that pressure to my opponent. And when I struck, he saw an opportunity to strike me, and he got a point. So I learned something from that. In the next part of the match, I was able to get a very clean kote, strike to the wrist. That basically ended the match. Both people uh, gained in knowledge from that match. And so that is the true meaning of Ko Ken Chiai, mutual benefit by crossing swords. We want to see Kendo go in a good way. It's always still a developing thing. It's not something that is dead or is stationary. It will evolve, although we're studying from the past, it is moving into the future. New technologies, new techniques may be introduced. These are all things to be seen.